Hi, my name is Joanne Kennedy and I'm a naturopath in Sydney, Australia, and I specialize in methylation and histamine intolerance. In this video, I'm going to share with you some of the testing that I'll be looking at when dealing with my histamine patients, which includes whole blood histamine, Dow enzyme, complete microbiome mapping, SIBO testing, as well as organic acids testing. So the whole blood histamine test basically tells us um, if there's high levels of histamine in the blood. Okay, in Australia, the range is 0.2 to 2 picomoles per litre. So anything over six is a bit of a red flag for me. So often I get patients come in and they've got their, hist their whole blood histamine test and they'll bring it in and the physician who um, ordered it for them will either write under methylator or over methylator next to the test results. Now, this is because methylation breaks down histamine. So if it's thought that if you have low blood histamine, that you're an over methylator, so you're breaking down your histamine too much, or if you have high blood histamine, that you're an under methylator, that you're not breaking down histamine enough. Now, this is a very simplified view of methylation and histamine. And this is because histamine can build up in the blood, not just because you've got methylation issues, but the main reasons is going to be coming from issues with the gut, such as dysbiosis, SIBO, oxalates, uh, leaky gut, this is going to cause your histamine to be high in your blood. So it's nothing to do with being an under over methylator. Okay, so you need to really, really get to the underlying cause of what is actually causing issues with your histamine in the first place. Another test that I often see is the Dow enzyme test. And this is because the Dow enzyme breaks down histamine. So a lot of people will want to know what their levels actually are. So I'm gonna share with you my screen. So here we can see the results from a Dow enzyme test. Now this person's levels are 12.8. Now, if you look down here, we can see what the test results interpretation tell us. So levels over 10 indicate low incidence of histamine intolerance. Levels between 3 and 10 indicate probable histamine intolerance. And levels under 3 indicate a high incidence of histamine intolerance. Now, this person is a patient of mine and her results have come in 12.8, which would tell us that there is a low incidence of histamine intolerance. Now, this girl has huge histamine issues, but they're not being driven from low Dow enzyme activity. They are being driven by oxalates. Okay, so she's got a lot of oxalates, it's causing a lot of inflammation, and a lot of histamine release in her body. Okay, so what we need to understand is that just because you're making adequate amounts of Dow, it doesn't mean that you don't have histamine issues because the Dow enzyme can simply be overloaded with the amount of histamine that it's needing to deal with. And it's coming from her body. It's coming from the the oxalates causing inflammation, releasing a lot of histamine. So the Dow's continually trying to deal with that. And when she eats high histamine foods, which needs to be broken down by Dow, she does not tolerate them at all. Okay, so I just wanted to flag that just because you do a Dow enzyme test and it comes back in range, it doesn't definitively say that you do not have histamine issues. Since histamine issues are so often coming from issues with the gut, another test that I really like my patients to do is either a comprehensive digestive stool analysis or what we also call a complete microbiome map as it gives us a lot of information around the causes of histamine intolerance in that person. So here we have the complete microbiome mapping test and it shows us a lot of markers that can indicate possible causes of histamine intolerance. So the first marker here is calprotectin. Now calprotectin is an antimicrobial protein mainly secreted by neutrophils, which are white blood cells. 
So fecal calprotectin is used as a laboratory marker for fecal inflammation in the diagnosis of irritable bowel disease. So that's Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So research shows that people with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis have significantly less Dow enzyme activity in the gastrointestinal tract compared to healthy individuals. And this is due to the damage to the intestinal cells and the microvilli that irritable bowel disease causes. Now, it's the Dow enzyme that breaks down histamine in the gut. So if you have raised levels of calprotectin in your stool test, this can mean you may need to supplement with Dow to get on top of your histamine issues. You definitely also need to get this investigated properly with your doctor if you haven't already been diagnosed with irritable bowel disease. The next marker I want to talk about is pancreatic elastase. So this patient is fine, but what happens if pancreatic elastase is insufficient? What can happen is it means you have reduced pancreatic enzymes and pancreatic enzymes are extremely important for breaking down carbohydrates, fats and proteins in the small bowel. And without pancreatic enzymes, you would definitely have an increase in food intolerances, including histamine and having low pancreatic enzymes is also a major cause of SIBO, which is in itself a major cause of histamine intolerance. The other marker I want to talk about is fecal secretory IgA. So secretory IgA is the main antibody in the mucus secretions of the gastrointestinal tract, and its role is to remove unwanted pathogens from the gut. So low levels of secretory IgA render a person more susceptible to an overgrowth of pathogenic microorganisms, including bacteria and yeast and parasites. And all of these things can increase histamine in the body. You need to therefore investigate what pathogenic microorganisms you have. And the good news is that this test is going to show us all the different types of microorganisms that you have. Now, the other thing that secretory IgA does is that it tags a food as acceptable. So low levels can cause food intolerances and this can all this can include histamine. OK, now another marker I want to talk about is fecal zonulin. Before I explain fecal zonulin, I want to first explain tight junctions. So an important part of the structure of the gut lining is a complex system called tight junctions. And the tight junctions role is to allow beneficial ions, nutrients and water to pass into the circulatory system and prevent unwanted pathogens and toxins and undigested food from entering. Now the tight junction complex is regulated by a protein called zonulin. And upon insult to the intestine, which can be from gluten or from dysbiosis, so dysbiosis is an imbalance between good and bad bacteria that causes inflammation, zonulin gets released, okay? And this dissembles the tight junctions that hold the intestinal cells together. Now, studies show that people with histamine intolerance have elevated zonulin levels in stool tests. And this is how you can get systemic symptoms of histamine, such as hives, eczema, headaches, migraines, anxiety, and insomnia from gut issues. So you need to identify what's causing the high zonulin. Like, is it gluten or is it dysbiosis? Okay, so if you then have a microbiome mapping test done, you can actually go down and actually have a look at what bugs you actually do have. Okay, now beta glucuronidase. This patient's test result isn't high or out of range, but this is such an important marker that I always look at. What we need to first understand that is in the liver, glucuronic acid is bound to a number of toxins as well as estrogen. And this is part of the phase two liver detoxification process. Now, the beta-glucuronidase enzyme is produced by certain gut bacteria. And this enzyme breaks the bond between the toxins and glucuronic acid, as well as estrogen and glucuronic acid. Now, high levels of beta-glucuronidase enzyme can increase the amount of estrogen circulating in the body. And when estrogen gets too high, it down-regulates the Dow enzyme and it also increases 
mast cell release of histamine. Okay, so estrogen detoxification issues are a major, major cause of histamine intolerance. Now, steatocrit is a marker of fat in feces and high levels can indicate fat malabsorption, which is due to a deficiency in pancreatic lipase or bile acids. And this can be an indicator of SIBO. And the bacteria in SIBO deconjugate bile acids, causing them to be ineffective in binding fats. Now, SIBO is a major cause of histamine intolerance. So if you have symptoms of, of histamine symptoms and high steatocrit, I do recommend that you test for SIBO as this might be one of your underlying causes. Now, furthermore, unabsorbed fats bind to calcium and this can decrease oxalate excretion in those susceptible to high oxalates. And this is because, because you need adequate amounts of calcium to bind up oxalates in the gut so they can be excreted in the feces. Now, oxalates are a major cause of histamine intolerance, and I write a lot about these in my book as it's not a very well-known cause of histamine intolerance, but it can really, really be cause people to have chronic histamine issues because they're so inflammatory that histamine is continually being released. Now, another marker here is the anti-gliadin IgA. Now, this antibody is found in 80% of patients with celiac disease. Now, celiac disease is an autoimmune disease occurring in genetically susceptible individuals. In these individuals, when gluten gets through a leaky gut into the blood, it triggers an autoimmune response. And the inflammation that occurs is so severe that it flattens the microvilli in the gut. And since the microvilli secrete the Dow enzyme, those with celiac disease have issues breaking down histamine effectively, and they will often have to supplement with Dow due to the amount of damage that's been done to the microvilli. Okay, so I really want to now talk to you about bacteria. So one of the first things I'm going to look at in my patients is what's going on with these opportunistic overgrowth of bacteria. Okay, so these are normal bacteria in the gut, but what happens is they can get to levels too high and can cause issues with histamine. In particular, I'm looking at the species that there's research that they do actually produce histamine. Okay, so Morganella is a histamine producer. Citrobacter and Klebsiella are also histamine producers. Okay, and these are common. We commonly see raised Citrobacter and raised Klebsiella in stool testing. Now, there's another bacteria that produce another biogenic amine, such as tyramine. Okay, and the biogenic amines are also broken down by the Dow enzyme. Okay, and the problem with this is that they are broken down by the Dow enzyme before histamine. So this can lead to a buildup of histamine in the gut. Now, these strains include, if we come up here, we can see the Enterococcus species, also Streptococcus species, as well as Proteus mirabilis. These are all tyramine producing bacteria. Okay, so a lot of people have heard about candida and people with chronic gut issues have often done a lot of candida, kill off dying protocols to reduce the candida. But what, what's often not known about candida is that it contains oxalates. Okay, so I'm always going to be looking at these markers, okay? Now, to explain oxalates a bit more, they're just tiny, sharp crystals that deposit in joints, in the gut, in the kidneys, the bladder, the urethra, the vulva, the bones, the lungs, the thyroid, and the brain. And this causes pain and inflammation. And all of this inflammation then causes the body to produce histamine. So I'm looking at these markers, okay, and ensuring that my patients don't have high yeast or high candida. If they do have an overgrowth of yeast and histamine symptoms, they might also want to do an organic acids test as this tests for oxalate levels. Now, another marker I'm very, very interested in looking at is what's going on with normal bacteria in the gut. Okay, with regards to histamine, I'm particularly interested in the number of low beneficial bacteria compared to high. Okay, so if you've got a lot of low bacteria and a lot of high bacteria, 
This is what we call dysbiosis. And dysbiosis itself is a major cause of histamine intolerance. Okay, now bifidobacteria species, I'm also particularly interested in looking at as bifidobacteria species break down histamine. So short chain fatty acids are really, really important. They're the end product of bacterial fermentation of dietary fiber. So short chain fatty acids provide many benefits to the overall health of the gastrointestinal tract, including inhibiting the growth of bad bacteria and they reduce inflammation. They also help form tight junctions. Okay, so without an adequate amount of short chain fatty acids, you are more susceptible to developing histamine intolerance. Okay, so you can see this is an invaluable test. It gives us so much information as to where we can start to treat the cause of histamine intolerance in our patients. So if I do suspect oxalate issues in my patients, I'll definitely get them to do an organic acids test as this will bring up oxalate levels. So here is the organic acids test and it's a really brilliant test. It's quite complex, but I'm just going to go through these oxalate metabolites. Okay, so as mentioned previously, oxalates form tiny sharp crystals that deposit in joints in the gut the kidneys, the bladder, the urethra, the vulva, the bones, lungs, thyroid, and the brain. Okay, they cause pain and inflammation, and all of this inflammation then causes the body to release histamine. So here we have the oxalate metabolites of glyceric, glycolic, and oxalic. Okay, now if glyceric or glycolic levels are high, this indicates an endogenous production of oxalates. So this means that the body is producing too much oxalate itself. Now, this can be due to a vitamin B6 deficiency, okay, as you need vitamin B6 to move oxalates out of the liver so it can be excreted through the urine, okay? Now, if the oxalic acid is high, like it is for this patient, it indicates the person has high oxalate due to a yeast or candida overgrowth. And as well, they might be consuming too many high oxalate foods. So there are a lot of foods that are very high in oxalates, particularly nuts and, spe uh, nuts and seeds, okay? And spinach is also very high in oxalate. Often people come to me, they're juicing bunches of spinach a day and they, they end up with horrendous oxalate and histamine issues, okay? So... Dealing with oxalates is really important when we're trying to reduce histamine in the body. So if you've got oxalate issues, you really need to be dealing with the oxalates as they will continue to drive tissue damage and inflammation and they will release a lot of histamine. So clinically, you will see these are the patients that are getting nowhere with treating SIBO or just reducing histamines in the diet, even dealing with the estrogen issues. Often these people do present with quite severe histamine issues, okay, or long-standing, okay? So uh, it's definitely worthwhile looking to oxalates if you have had long-standing histamine issues. So last but by no means least is the SIBO test. Now, SIBO really is a major driver of histamine intolerance in so many people. It's really, really common and it's often just skipped over. People are just looking at the large bowel, not the small bowel. Okay, so I'm going to share with you my screen. Here we can see the SIBO test results from a patient of mine. Now, she came to me with horrendous histamine symptoms okay she was getting hives like every 30 minutes migraines vertigo terrible gut issues and this has been a really chronic issue for her for a long time and no one had looked at the small bowel they'd just done the large bowel stuff she'd even had a fecal transplant okay and all her issues were coming from the small intestine so you can see her levels are literally off the chart okay they go up up sort of over the actual um, the range that they're looking at on these test results, okay? So 
What happens in SIBO is that when you consume foods, FODMAP foods and resistant starch, the bacteria in the small bowel that is, it shouldn't be there in numbers that it's there, take those foods and convert them into gas. So we can see here, we've got the hydrogen gas and the methane gas. Okay, so hydrogen gas needs to go up over 20 points from the baseline. See, it goes from 3 to 9, up to 37, up to 110, up to 147, even up to 304. Okay, so there's definitely a positive result for hydrogen SIBO. And methane gas needs to go up 10 points. So it goes 17 to 32, up to 53, up to 80, and it stays high. So it's definitely a positive result for methane. Okay, so what is happening is all of this gas is causing a lot of inflammation in the small bowel, which is going to release a lot of histamine. Essentially, SIBO is dysbiosis, which is going to cause leaky gut. This is why you get all these systemic symptoms. And it also, all this inflammation damages the cells and reduces the synthesis and excretion of the Dow enzyme. If you suspect you've got SIBO, you've got the symptoms of it, if you've got the risk factors for it, I've detail this all in my book, then I highly recommend you get treated for SIBO and make sure you get the levels down, okay, because you can't get on top of your histamine symptoms if you have SIBO.